Howdy gum people. Uh, gonna talk about uh, judges here. I got a few questions on judges. So um, let's talk about kind of some judge issues or or how the judge system works in my opinion and from my experience. Alright so we have this um, how judges get to be judges. They're usually political appointees. Judge knows somebody, he gives to some campaign, whatever, he becomes a friend, he's a lawyer, he wants to be a judge, he does something for a politician, and he gets appointed on a judgeship as a payback for some reason. Uh, either loyalty, helping on his campaign, whatever. So judges are not picked because they're the best lawyers. They're picked because of who they know, and, uh, you know, where they happen to be, if it's at the right time when a judge gets killed or died and they're next in line or whatever, and whether they get a point or not. So that, that's how, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, judges are top lawyers. In order to be a judge, there's this big process. Hell, I don't even know if they do a background on these guys. I mean, they just probably check the bar to make sure he hasn't got any complaints on him, and that's about it that I know of. I don't know of any cop agency that does backgrounds on judges before they're appointed. Uh, now, when cops get... Their job, their background is stricter than anybody in the world. I mean, to be a cop in California, to be a cop, you got to fill out a 14-page background with neighbors, references, uh, family, friends, ex-girlfriends, ex-friends, ex-employees. I mean, and they go through all your background. Then after, you, after they do all that, they call you in, they do an interview. Then you have to go through a polygraph test and ask you, are you lying and is everything true? And... You know, if they have any questions about something they're concerned about, they'll ask you about that on the lie detector and a polygraph. Then you have to go to a shrink, and you have to take a four-hour written test from a shrink, and then they go through all the written tests, and then uh, you have, in the afternoon, two or three hours with the shrink where he's showing you little cards, asking you these silly questions, explain this, and, you know, how was your childhood and all this other crap. So, uh, in order to be a cop, it's, it's an extensive background. Your credit... Uh, your background package, all your credit is checked, uh, any tickets, I mean it's just and, and and to be honest the background is just a way for agencies to get rid of somebody that they want to get rid of for some reason because there's no standard on what passes, it, it's, it's not a, a clear standard you either pass or fail. It's all subjective. So me being a white male can get disqualified because I had two tickets, two speeding tickets, and that could show non-responsibility. Whereas I a black guy because we need to hire minorities and we have to lower the standards and do all this PC crap to hire enough black guys, this black guy can get hired and he may have been arrested, admitted to doing felony drugs, uh, have a felony on his record that was expunged, and, you know, has poor financial records. But they will hire him and they won't hire the white guy who's got two traffic tickets. So that, that's the problem with quotas and PC crap. I've seen it, you know, same way if you got to hire a female, you know, you, you kind of pick the worst, the least of the females, the one that you can kind of deal with the most. It's not the best or that they compete with any of the guys. So, but for judges, I don't think there's anything. So I got off track there for judges. Judges, I, when a judge gets appointed, he usually gets appointed because of a vacancy or something, and then... Most states do an election process, and each time after that you get elected. Most people's not going to not elect a judge. That's the problem with the voting public, is they always want to go with this known entity, or I recognize the name or popularity, or, or the incumbent. Well, he's in there, and I haven't heard him bad, so he must be doing a good job, so I'll vote for the incumbent. I am an anti-incumbent guy. I don't like anybody in government for any length of time. If they're incumbent, I don't vote for them. So if I know they're incumbent, I'm voting for the new guy. Because government needs to change. The longer someone sits in there, the worse they are. Same with judges on a bench. So how does a judge get to, like, you know, does a judge get to work crimes? Does he get to pick? Does he want to work child cases? Does Again, in California, and I think most states kind of do the same thing, it's through a rotation. So... This year, or they'll do a two-year stint or a year stint, this year, if I'm a judge, I'm assigned to child custody court. 
So I do all of child custody and that's it. So I develop my expertise especially because I've got lawyers arguing in front of me. So I learn the law as I go. I get an expert. All these people are giving me cases. They're giving me reasons and case law and, and why they want this thing enforced, etc. So it's an education process for me on the bench. And now I become kind of a subject matter expert on child custody issues. And then another judge will be maybe working you know, high felonies or, or, or just felony cases. And, and then they might have a misdemeanor judge that just hears misdemeanors. So when, when they have these different judges, and, and, some, and there's usually more than one. I mean, we probably had, you know, 20 DAs that worked felonies and then, you know, 20 that did misdemeanors and one in, that worked child abduction. One attorney was just child abduction. Another attorney did just DV cases for domestic violence. So he got all good with that law. And, you know, and defense attorneys, they kind of have the same thing. They have their lawyers to where there's little tiers. You work your way up. The less experienced, the lower you are, you start with the jobs that nobody want. Kind of like the crap jobs that, that, that are just kind of a pain in the butt and they're repetitive. Like domestic violence. Nobody wants to work domestic violence. You're always dealing with victims. You can't make anybody happy. It's ongoing. So a, a lot of people will do domestic violence for a couple years and they're burnt out and they want to move to something else. So you have all these specialties in the lawyers and in the DAs and the judges. All lawyers want to be judges. I don't care what they say. They want the black robe, the power, so they can sit up there and have my courtroom, my bailiff, my armed guards, and have all the power. So I don't care who the judge is. People, oh, you know, this guy. I see some good judges, seen bad judges, just like anything. They're people. But what happens is when when you go through this rotation, if you get a new judge in an area that doesn't have experience, like a new judge in in, in, in child custody case. The, the outcome of cases for a while doing his learning curve are not going to be consistent with the judge that was there two years before that was educated, knew the law, and, and was fairly consistent on what he did. So that's a problem with changing judges. But it's good to get them out so they don't have their little domain, they don't get too cocky, and they get burnt out and they want to do something different too. So here's how the DA can dictate the judges. What happens is one judge you have a courtroom of judges, and one judge is called the presiding judge. The presiding judge is kind of like the head judge for this two-year stint, and it's rotationary. It's not like this judge is the best and the greatest of the judges. It just happens to be his turn to be the presiding judge. So he becomes the presiding judge. So if there's any issues with the judges, guess who decides and who their boss is on whether it's right or wrong? The presiding judge. Well, Guess what? The presiding judge last year was being judged by one of his peers, and he was the presiding judge. So what are the chances you think a presiding judge is going to find another judge of wrongdoing? Slim to none, slim left town. They just don't do it. They know that I'm hearing my peers, and next year one of these guys is going to be sitting where I'm sitting, and I may get in a jam. So I'm not going to find one of my judges in contempt, bad, wrong, etc. because they're going to be in my position soon. Is that a good system? Yeah, it's good and bad, yin and yang, you know, all good and bad, all bad and good. So that's the problem with having the presiding judge. Sometimes when the presiding judge is a good judge, I like it. It's easier if there's a conflict, if there's something going on, if a judge is denying warrants or being a pain in the ass or he's a liberal judge and he's always scratching warrants. He's like, I'm not giving these cops a warrant. I don't care what it says. I don't want to sign it. So, and, and the way cops, cops don't get, we're not supposed to pick who reviews our warrants. When a cop brings a judge, a warrant to a judge, it is supposed to, if the camera moves, my cat's rubbing on it because he knows I'm filming. So if, if a cop brings a warrant to a judge, it is supposed to be luck of the draw. Whatever judge is on call, and they have a little list on who's on call for this week, and this week, and this week, and who's on this day, and any judge is doing this time, you'll hear. Now, what some cops will do is call judge shopping, and you're not supposed to do it. Is it illegal? No. Is it, is it a crime? No. Could you get in trouble? Yeah. I mean, what, what could happen is, if you go judge shopping, and, they, and, a, and a defense attorney knows that you went to a certain judge, that always signs your warrants and you like them, you have a personal relationship, and he signs all your judges, he could use that to maybe get your warrant thrown out or question or throw some mud on the wall during a trial because you went judge shopping and you didn't go to the judge that was on call. And then they'll get you on the stand and say, did you know this judge was on call? Uh, no, I didn't. Did you check? No, I didn't. 
Who'd you take your warrant to? Judge so and so. Well, why did you take it to him? Because I've taken warrants to him before and he knows me and I know him. Isn't it true you took it to him because you know he would sign it even if it wasn't valid and you didn't have enough probable cause? No, that's not true. So you just ignored the list and you didn't take it to the judge on call and you went to your own personal judge that you felt more comfortable with to get your warrant signed, but you're telling me your warrant was good and this judge would have signed it anyway, but you didn't take it to him. And you're like, whatever. <laughs> I mean, what can you do? So that's why you don't want to go judge shopping and do that. It just gives the impression of impropriety. It gives the impression that you might have something to hide or you're not above board. So you know what? You take the judge. Now I know cops that would take their judge to one guy, this one judge we had. He never read the freaking warrants. He was buddies with the cops. He had been a judge for a long time. He was a DA. He was one of the good old boys. And I don't care what warrant you brought him, he would turn to the last page and sign it. And it drove me nuts. I didn't like taking warrants to him. The whole purpose of a warrant is to have a judge review and say, I've got a problem with this, or to ask you questions, or to critically evaluate the, 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 your, your probable cause statement and to say, is it reasonable? Because when he just signs it and it's BS, that just means that anything you get, you could lose. And if you do that on a good case where you're trying to get DNA evidence to hook somebody up to a rape or a murder, and then it comes out and they ask you, when you gave this warrant to the judge, did the judge read it? You go, no, I don't know. I wasn't watching. I gave it to him and he signed it. Oh, you didn't pay attention? Because the way when you bring a, a judge a warrant, he looks at it, he's supposed to read the entire warrant. Now, the good judges, they would initial at the bottom of every page. And I like them. I remember Judge Ramsey, and I don't know if he's still around, up in Sacramento. Black guy, top-notch judge, sitting up there. When he, when you, when he saw you, I'd, I'd walk into court just like this with a warrant in my hand, and he knew I was top because there were warrants to him, and I'd stand in the back of his courtroom, and as soon as he recognized me, he'd be like, you know what? I got an officer right here that needs a warrant. We're going to take a recess. And he would stop the court, call you back there, and review your warrant. Just a great guy. Good that way, but you know what? He didn't let nothing slide. He, he would... He, he asked me a couple questions on a couple warrants ago. You know what? I need that added into the thing. He asked me a question. I give him an answer, and he goes, I really would feel better if that was in the court. Because what happens is when a warrant goes in, the warrant is restricted by the corners of the page. Nothing else can be argued except what's in the contents of that warrant. So if you and the judge asks you a question, you answer it, and he goes, oh, yeah, that makes sense, and he signs it, that can never come into the decision process because it's not written on the warrant. So that's why you want to make your warrants detailed. I know guys that would do four or five sentence warrants and judge would sign it. I thought that was BS. You can't justify. I mean, you can, but it's pretty weak. And, and but you know that, that it depends on the judge. And again, this one judge, man, he would just sign everything. I, I mean, I, I literally would say, Judge, I need you to read this one because this one's got some issues, and I want to make sure I'm on legal ground. Well. You sure it looks pretty thick. I'm like, yeah, if you don't have time, I said, I can take another judge. No, I guess I'll read it. So he thumbed through it and then he signed it. But the good judge, Judge Ramsey, he would initial each page at the bottom. So if there was ever an issue, did he sign it? He would be able to say, hey, I'm the judge that signed that. And if you look at each page, I initial it. And I know I read each page because I initial it. Now, some judges would initial, but they still wouldn't read. They just go through each page, initial each page, and then get to the back page. And they would just say, explain what I got here. It looks like a big warrant. So I'd just give them a quick rundown of the case. Okay, I'm Chase Guy. He's a gang member. He's got gang tasks. We've wrestled him before. He's got a large criminal history. We know he's on parole probation. He jumped probationary. He jumped parole. He's running, and we know he's at this house because this is his uh, daughter's house. we got his cell phone. We got him there, and basically we want a warrant to go hit the house. So he'd be like, okay, that sounds good. And he wouldn't read the warrant. Is that right? Look, it's not my job to make a judge do a warrant. But the problem, I guess the theory is, if you go to different judges, you're going to be questioned by the judge on the law, on the probable cause, and it's going to be done the right way. Now, how many warrants do you think get questioned by the defense attorney and get thrown out? Slim to none. I mean, it is so slim it's pathetic. Because a warrant shifts all liability from the cop to the judicial reviewer, the judge. The DA initials it, who is an attorney, who's a prosecutor, who's part of the team. I wrote it, 
and I swore to it that it's true and correct as part of the prosecution team, and then the judge, who is an officer of the court, reviewed it independently and felt that there was probable cause. So to get, to get over that hurdle and standard to overturn a warrant is very hard. That's why cops that don't do warrants, I'm like, dude, you, you got to learn how to do a warrant. And, and they're easy to do, and the more you do, the easier they get. And they just give you so much protection. It's just all liability, and the defense never fights a warrant. It's just too big of a hurdle. So how do, how do DAs affect what judges do on a bench? They're judges. They don't work for the DA, right? Wrong. They don't work for them. But who investigates a judge if they get in trouble? DA. Can the DA start a criminal investigation? You always hear DA's office leaked a criminal investigation, and then when you ask them about the criminal investigation, they go, oh, we're sorry, we can't talk about it, it's an ongoing investigation. If you can't talk about it and it's an ongoing investigation, how the hell does everybody know there's an investigation going on? Oh, we can't talk about it. So when they leak investigations, they have investigations about they're trying to smear or get some public pressure on a judge. So it's an old tactic that DAs use. I'll just investigate you. If you start giving me a hassle in court and you start doing some shit, I'll open a criminal investigation next time I have any reason to open one, and I'll leak it to the press, and your name will be mud in the next elections, and they'll remember that you were in a criminal investigation. So that's how the DA can put pressure on judge. So are judges scared of DAs? I wouldn't say scared, but do they have a healthy respect? Yeah. Another way a DA can screw a judge is, let's say you have a judge on the bench, and he, there's only three three or four or five, ten felony judges. There's a thing called point six, and I'm not sure exactly, it's some code, blah, 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 point six, and in some section, that allows a DA to dismiss a judge for no cause. I can just go as a DA, I can go in front of a judge and go, Your Honor, I don't want you here in this case. I don't have to give a reason, I don't have to say why, I can just do it, and that case will be changed. So, how that is abused and how DAs hold that against somebody, and I've seen this done to two or three different judges, is you get a judge on a bench and the presiding judge assigns this judge to hear felony cases and you piss off the DA. And the DA gets complaints from his deputy DAs doing trials in front of you that you're harassing them, you're not being fair, and you're giving the defense all the good leads. So what does the DA do? The DA says, I'm doing a blanket .6 on him. I don't want any of my DAs hearing a case. Every one of you, if you get a case that's in front of this judge, you point six him for no reason and say you don't want him here a judge. Guess what? He puts that judge out of business. Now you have a judge sitting on the bench and he's not hearing any cases. Because the DA, every time he gets a case assigned, they scratch it. So what does that do? It puts more pressure and work on the other GAs. It clogs up the court. So the presiding judge will normally go to that judge and say, man, i got to reassign you, because if I don't reassign you, they're not going to hear you any cases. You're not doing anything. All the other judges get swamped. Let me move you over here to child custody or domestic violence or something else, and I'm going to put someone else on the felony things because the DA is doing that. You think that pisses off a judge? Sure. But you know what? There's not a whole lot they can do about it. Is that wrong? Hell yeah, I think it's wrong. I think it's intimidation. I think it's bully power, and, and I don't think it should be happening, but it does. And the, the, the public doesn't know all the games and how much power district attorneys have on the system and outcome. You know, it's supposed to be equal. We're supposed to get a defense. They're supposed to do uh, prosecute without prejudice. Don't believe any of that crap. DA, I'm telling you, I've known a lot of cops and a lot of DAs. And the percentage of cops that I thought were dirty is very, very small and few. And I can only think of maybe three or four. The percentage of DAs that are dirty is 30-40% because it's all about winning their reputation, impressing the boss, getting convictions, getting big sentences, being the big dog that puts somebody away for 200 years and I got this many death penalties and I got... That's what DAs are all about because that's how you run for office later and you build your resume on how great and aggressive you were on crime. So when I read all that about somebody running, to me it's a turnoff, and I'm like, you know what? I know how you got those numbers. I know what you did to get those numbers, and I'm not impressed. But that's kind of like behind the scenes a little bit on judges. Uh, you know, can they get in trouble? Yeah. I mean, there was a judge, we had one that was making pickle comments or dildo comments or something. It was offending women, and he did it one too many times, and they end up kind of saying, you know what? You need to retire because 
now we got employees that don't want to work for you. And so he got a little out of control and he had to retire. And he was actually a pretty good judge. He was just a little loose in the lips and kind of had a fun time joking around. And sometimes, uh, especially in California, liberal women don't, don't appreciate jokes. All right, we'll end that there on judges.